The grace of God is greater than we understand. We've been looking at uh, the unwise decisions that were uh, made by those counseling the Pharaoh in Egypt. Uh, and now we move on to the fact that Egypt is redeemed. There's a future date coming when Egypt will be redeemed, and so will uh, Assyria. But that date hasn't come yet. But we're going to read from verse 19 of chapter 19. Or sorry, uh, verse 18 uh, from chapter 19 in the book of Isaiah. In that day, five cities in Egypt will speak the language of Canaan and swear allegiance to the Lord Almighty. One of them will be called the city of the sun. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the heart of Egypt and a monument to the Lord at its border. It will be a sign and witness to the Lord Almighty in the land of Egypt. When they cry out to the Lord because of their oppressors, he will send them a savior, a defender, and he will rescue them. So the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians. And in that day, they will acknowledge the Lord they will worship with sacrifices and grain offerings. They will make vows to the Lord and keep them. The Lord will strike Egypt with a plague. He will strike them and heal them. They will turn to the Lord and he will respond to their pleas and heal them. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to, the Assyri to Assyria. The Egyptians and the Assyrians will worship together. In that day, Israel will be a third along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. The Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handwork, and Israel, my inheritance. May God bless this, his holy word. This prophecy about Egypt coming and being redeemed by the Lord has still to be fulfilled and it's at some future day when the knowledge of the Lord shall cover the earth in the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But this should be an encouragement to us to carry on bringing the gospel to the lost before it's too late. Looking at Egypt, they were lost, but God had mercy and grace on them. It's never too late until it's too late. It's never too late until it's too late. It's never too late to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and, and accept him as your savior, but there will be a day when it's too late. I do a lot of funerals, and for them who do not trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, when they're in the coffin, it's too late. They've left it too long before making that decision. You see, we are still to go on working. We're still to go on laboring for the gospel, looking for his coming and expecting it but not relaxing our efforts because he hasn't come yet. We need to be about the Lord's business. Are you expecting him to come back? Are you expecting him to come back this afternoon? No. Maybe. Hope so. Yeah, what's our reality check on all that? Because he could come back now in the next uh, split second, like a twinkling in the eye. Can you remember, maybe, you, maybe you're still like this, uh, at Christmas time when all the presents are under the Christmas tree and you're all excited. Can you remember this? Or maybe you still get excited about presents under the Christmas tree and... Uh, did you ever do that? When, uh, you, you go all the presents under the tree and you go to bed and all you're thinking about is those presents and thinking, oh, time. And then at five o'clock, you're wide awake 
and you're sneaking downstairs and you're shaking. Did you ever do that? Or is it just me? I still do that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is in there? <laughs> yes. You got caught. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You always get caught. I just tell you that, you know. I'm 65 and I always get caught. <laughs> you know, we're so excited. But how excited are we about the coming of Jesus? How excited are we about the coming of Jesus? In Psalm 68, 31, it says... Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon stretch her hand out to God. Really what that psalm is saying is that these people, the uh, Egyptians and the uh, Ethiopians, will soon stretch out their hands to God. They were enemies of God. They were enemies of God's people. And now they, in verse 19, it speaks about them having altars and pillars and offerings to God. And as we think about that in a spiritual sense, the church of God has no need for these material altars and material sacrifices, for we have Christ as our altar and our priest and prayer and praise to be our spiritual offerings. In these end times, Egypt will be converted along with Assyria and the people of the land shall worship the Most High. And this tells us something of the power of God to save and transform. Without the transforming power of God, where would we be today? Where would we be where would you be today if God hadn't stepped into your life? What would be happening to you if God hadn't stepped in to your life? Well, we don't know, do we? Because he did step in and he did transform us. And here we have a wonderful display of the grace of God in this promise to Egypt we actually see the very heart of God revealed. We see a display of what God will do, not just to Egypt, but to others, the display of grace which God gives among the sons of men. And it tells us that we're to be a, a sign and a witness. Well, who are we witnessing? Are we witnessing ourselves or are we witnessing Jesus? in our actions, and in our vocabulary. Do you want to change, but you're struggling? Are you filled with guilt at the sin that is hidden? Do you ever think that you are too bad for heaven? Well, if you fall into any of those categories, then there's good news for you this morning. God's grace is sufficient for you. And when they cry to the Lord because of their oppressors, he will send them a savior, a defender, and a deliverer. Well, we're going to look at three things uh, which will encourage us this morning. First, the grace of God for the very worst of us. Secondly, the grace of God that sends a savior, and then the grace of God who changes us, who transforms us. Do we fully understand the grace of God? You've got to remember that Egypt was an enemy of God's. It was over Egypt that they triumphed at the Red Sea when Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? And, and whenever you read about Egypt in the Bible, it's synonymous with the world, with worldly thinking, with worldly actions. Yet the grace of God is to come to Egypt. And so it will often come to the worst enemies that God has. Just think about that for a moment, because it's, it's quite a difficult one to swallow, isn't it? 
you know, it, it's, it's nice when nice people get saved. You know, in, when people, you would say, oh, they're such a good person. You know, they just ooze Christ. But they're not saved. But then, then they get saved, you know, it's just, it's just. But see when the pedophile, the abuser, the murderer, the rapist, they get saved. You go, sure about that. They deserve hell. Now, how, how, how do we feel uh, about that? And yet God's grace is sufficient to save to the uttermost for the worst enemies of God. He can pluck them from that. Isn't there a little bit within us that says, well, they deserve, they deserve to be punished. They deserve to be punished. I'm actually quite a nice person, so I shouldn't be punished. Is that our thinking? But none of us are nice. We've all sinned against God. Yet God's grace has come to Egypt, who was an enemy of God. No one is beyond his redemption. Think of Saul of Tarsus. He was an enemy of God, throwing Christians into prison and having them killed, and yet was met and conquered by eternal love, and his heart was renewed. He was made an apostle, saved by Christ himself. Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and asked, why do you persecute me? Is that you this morning? Are you a conquered enemy of God? It's hard to think, isn't it? But before you were saved, you were an enemy of God. You think, well, I was quite a nice person before I got saved. In fact, since I've been saved, I realized how such a nasty person I was. <laughs> I realized how nasty I can be. Suddenly, it's all reflected. Do you know that you're a conquered enemy of God if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ today? A conquered enemy. God's grace did that. God's grace saved you. That's amazing, isn't it? You didn't get soaked. <laughs> you stayed dry. God's electing love has chosen some of those who are most aggressive against Christ. And the power of the Holy Spirit has come upon them and turned the lions into lambs. And that's the transforming power of the gospel. If you're here this morning and are resisting God, if you haven't received him yet, then you're an enemy of God. Accept him, turn to him, repent, and believe. The Egyptians were idolatrous, and we always must check ourselves to idolatry in our lives, for it's very, very subtle. It's whatever you put before God in our lives. And this is the bit... And I keep going on about this by Sunday by Sunday. So if you come next Sunday, I'll probably be saying the same. <laughs> but I like you to look inwardly. You know what that means? It's, it's thinking about what you think about. Because there's two parts to the brain. There's the bit that tells the other part what to do. And it's that bit that you need to think about, you need to talk to. Do you talk to yourself? Do you? Do you talk to yourself? Not out loud. No. 
actually, that's quite worrying if you start doing that out loud. I've started doing that out loud now, but <laughs> it's quite worrying. <laughs> but, but yeah, we do talk to ourselves all the time. And so you need to then start thinking about, well, what am I telling myself? You've done the same page as me on this. Or do you do not talk to yourselves. You talk to yourself. Ah, good. I call it mind chatter. And when you start thinking about what you're thinking about, it's like knitting with spaghetti. <laughs> so, so you really need to think about that bit that's thinking about what you're thinking about. Right? Are you, are you still with me? Good. I like it. I like it. And, and so you need to look deep within to think about what you're thinking about and then check it against the Word of God. That's important because it's at that point that we realize that there could be idolatry in our hearts because it's there where you find where have I placed God in my thinking? Where is God in my thinking? I know where God is in because you told me because you get up in the morning and the first thing is you commit yourself to the Lord for that day. That's a good thing to do, by the way. Because then you're putting your mind into a spiritual plane. So the, th the bit of the brain that thinks about what you think about is now thinking about God. Great thing to do. It's an amazing thing to do. Because then you see God in all things that happen to you. Where's my pencil gone? You know, it's that. <laughs> it's when that happens... Well, not like that. <laughs> it's when that happens to the bag of water and it doesn't burst out all over you, it's because you've committed it to God and his grace is sufficient. Am I making sense? Do, do you understand what I'm talking about? No? It's, it's, a, it's when something happens to you and it, and it absolutely feels as though it's destroying you and you just trust God in it. And, 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 and he brings you through it. And often is the time is when you look back, you say, oh, I can see God in it. But at the time, you think you're going to get soaked, didn't you? You thought you were going to get soaked. You did very well because you stood underneath it. But you feel as though you're going to get soaked. But when you trust God, he protects you and he brings you through it. But it's at that point that we need to realize, is there something that we're putting before God in our lives? The Egyptians had wisdom. It was worldly, and, and, and it caused a lot of confusion and, and vulnerability, and yet the grace of God came to them. They thought they could work things out themselves. How many of you think you can work things out for yourselves? But actually, they couldn't. And God confused them. And the grace of God came to them. And that's the wondrous evidence of a sovereign God. The devil cannot darken a soul so much that the blood of Christ can't make it as white as snow. I don't know who said that. It wasn't me, although it sounded like me when I said it. But it's, it, was, it was well worth writing down that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you again. Right? The devil cannot darken a soul so much that the blood of Christ can't make it as white as snow. Do you want me to say it again? Because I think he's brilliant. Whoever wrote that, and I didn't put a note of his name, it might have been Spurgeon. It could have been Spurgeon. Do you think it's a Spurgeon one? Could, does it? All right, we'll have that one. The devil cannot darken a soul so much that the blood of Christ can't make it white as snow. No matter how much you're an enemy of God, God can still save us. God's grace can still transform us. We need to remember that God can reach us at our lowest and lift us up to our highest. Who's been to the low? Who's been in the pit and God has lifted us up to the highest? Who's, gosh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everybody. Yeah, everybody. That's six. And that's the marvelous thing of the sovereignty of God. That's the marvelous thing about the grace of God. 
And, and in the, I think it was the King James, it said that it was a city of destruction. Yet God looked, it says it's a city of sun in the NIV. But I think in the, uh, in the King James, it says a city of destruction. And God looked upon it with mercy. God will deliver and save us. No matter the depths that we fall to in our sin, the Lord is able to make us new in Christ Jesus. Now that is really good news for us to hear this morning. No matter what you're going through, no matter what difficulties, no matter uh, what these things that disappoint us, these things that we fear, these things that like pride in our lives, these, all these landmines that we've been doing on a Sunday night, all these things affecting us, they cannot stop God from lifting us to the highest, most position. And that's really good news for us to hear this morning. The gospel has found some of its brightest jewels in the lowest depths of sin and depravity. God's grace is for the very worst of us. And God's grace sends a savior. And he shall send them a savior and a great one. And he shall deliver them. It's Jesus, the son of God, who has come to save us to save us from every sin, to save us from temptation to sin, from the power of our habits, from the landmines of Satan. He's come to save us from the eternal death, to save us from the wrath of God. God has sent us a savior. Because we can't save ourselves, so we need a savior. It reminds me of the picture of uh, the man walking along by the, by the lake, and he saw someone in trouble in, in the lake, and, and that person was going down. You know, you go down three times, and you don't, third time you don't come back up. So they, they've been down once, and they come back up, and they're spluttering, a bit like Firkin Point, <laughs> which is we're taking the kids to. So we mustn't go off the edge, because it goes really deep. So then you get into trouble out there, then you come up, and you're shouting, help. And he sees them out there, so he goes and he grabs the life belt, and it's attached to a piece of string, and you throw the life belt out. And that person then has the opportunity to grab hold before it's too late. And then they get pulled in. But see, if they don't grab hold of the life belt, they'll be lost. Go down again. And it takes ages to find you. Jesus is that life belt. Jesus is the life belt. Are you going to grasp hold of Jesus and allow you to be pulled into safety? He is great in what he has done. He's poured out his life for sinners that they may live through his death. And this is the great sacrifice. Christ who gave himself on the cross was truly God and truly man. And there can be no limit to the value of the atonement which he made. Just think about that <clears throat> for a moment. That God became flesh to dwell among us. He had to die on a cross. Remember who this is. How deep is our sin? that the only way for it to be cleansed is through God becoming flesh and being nailed to a cross and dying and then rising again. That is the depth of our sin. We, we tend to make it, and, and in the church today, there's so many, I heard somebody on the radio this morning, just denouncing the word of God on, on the radio, just whitewashing sin, just whitewashing it. No, it's really, really, really serious. The depth of our sin is so serious that God himself had to become flesh to be nailed to a cross to die so that we can be cleansed. It's not a little thing. It's a massive thing. And yet today, they just sweep it under the carpet. No, don't talk to people about sin. And certainly don't tell them about hell. Because it will frighten them. Boy, we should be frightened. 
And now he is risen and he stands before God to intercede for us with authority. He pleads before the throne of God for his chosen ones. He holds the keys of death and hell. And the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. What a savior we have. Don't doubt him. Cast yourself upon him. He is mighty to save. And you know, this grace of God is powerful enough to transform us, to change us. It says, in that day, five cities in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan. God shall make us speak that holy and pure language which marks the children of God. Our speech should be humble and gentle. And when we come to speak about Jesus, we should have the tears in our eyes when we realize the grace that God has shown us and that we should serve him. Is that us this morning? Do we realize what we've been saved from? That grace that is poured out to us, that is transforming us, changing us. Are we crying out to God? You know, sometimes we have to be so distressed. You know, the pencils, remember the pencils going into that. We have to be so distressed of what might happen in these circumstances that we might get soaked with a bag of water with these things that are happening in our lives that are so uh, distressing. And, and yet it's in that distress, it's in that uh, f- position that we find ourselves, in the circumstance that we find ourselves, that we find God. We find God because we've got nowhere else to go. We've run out of rope. We've run out of ourselves. And we cry out to God. And, and that's the best thing we can possibly do. That's the, that's the thing that God hears most is when we cry out to God. When we cry out to God, he hears our souls cry. It's not like a shopping list that we're just going through. It's coming from the heart. Lord, have mercy upon me. Lord, I'm at the end of myself. I can find no answer to the predicament that I'm in. Lord, help me. And it's when you cry out in those circumstances, God hears you. And you know something? He doesn't just come in like a magic wand and goes, and everything's sorted. It can take years, but he has heard you. And as those years tick by, you see that you're moving and being transformed to becoming more like him. And you see how he's putting the pieces together and things are changing in your life. Who's been there? Who's experienced that? Yeah. And the Lord will strike Egypt, striking and healing, and they will return to the Lord. Have you felt as though you've been struck? But he's healing you. Oh, man. This is so much for us today, isn't it? When an unbeliever is in trouble, they have nothing to give them hope. No good comes out of the trouble. But when we get our hearts renewed, when we receive our Savior, then trouble can be the greatest blessing in disguise. What a blessing it is to have the grace of God, seeing it turn turn adverse circumstances into blessings. And then in verse 23, in that day there shall be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria. You know, they were enemies of each other, the Egyptians and the Assyrians. They hated each other. They were enemies. But imagine two brothers were at war and would not speak to each other, and one of them gets saved by grace. And he thought, if only my brother might be converted. He wanted to fall into his brother's arms and make it all up and be friends again. Meanwhile, the other brother had heard the gospel somewhere else, and his soul had been saved And he goes to find his brother and they're reconciled and the families that had been at a distance are brought together in love. Is there strife in your family? 
Is there a distance from someone you once was close to? The good news is that the gospel can break down those barriers and reunite. Assyria and Egypt will be brought together. They will worship the, God, the Lord. They will speak the language of Canaan. Genuine grace makes us forgive as we have been forgiven. They shall be blessings in the midst of the land and it shall be said, blessed be Egypt, my people. You see, God will save those who are enemies of God. God has sent a savior who is his, the cross is sufficient for all to come. But it's efficient for those who are his, who hear his voice. And he will transform. The grace of God will transform us into the image of, of his son, Jesus Christ. When we trust in him and have faith in him, regardless of the circumstances, he puts all things together for good to those that love him and are called according to his grace, right? Lord and Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your message this morning. May we begin to understand the grace that you have poured out upon us. We're undeserving of it, and yet it's transformational. Lord, as we see that grace that can save sinners, we once were enemies of God and now we've been conquered by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, that grace that sent us a savior, for we cannot save ourselves, it's only through Jesus Christ. And Lord, that grace that is transforming us, that is changing us moment by moment, year by year, until the glory when we will have the full impact of that transformation. And so, Lord, bless us this morning and keep us in Jesus' name. Amen.